I'm in Luke chapter 5 today, Luke chapter 5, so we'll read some scripture together and then I'll, then I'll give you a chance to, to sit down. So our word for the year, as you know, is inconvenient faith, that uh, convenient Christianity is the enemy of your soul. And I think all of us desire to have this passion for God. I mean, uh, most of us here today would say, I, I want to be devoted to God, I want to follow God. Um, but so often we can drift. And, and you ever feel like the gauges are off a little bit? Like you're like, man, I'm just, I'm not passionate about him right now. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not thinking about him. I, I want to, but I, I keep, or you find yourself making just poor choices. It, I, if you want some gauges, the eight core practices are really great gauges in your life because typically you're going to find that something's off and that, oh, that's right, I don't have, I, I haven't been going to my core group. That's what's going on in my life. I'm not, I, I'm not practicing godly friendships or, or maybe it's Sunday worship, like oh, I gotta get that consistent rhythm going again in my life or, or maybe it's generous giving. You're like, yeah, I, I haven't been generous to anybody. I'm buying everything for myself, keeping everything for myself, thinking only about my bills and I gotta, and God will just help you and the eight core practices are really checks that help us but what you gotta remember about the eight practices is they don't save you. Come on, turn to somebody and tell them that does not save you. It's not save you. Now turn back to them and tell them you are saved by the grace of Jesus. You are saved by the grace of Jesus. These are just tools that help us along life's journey, how to walk and what we should be doing. So we're talking about this core practice. We're doing this throughout the year at all these, looking at all 80 of these practices. And, and so we're talking about the practice of daily devotions. But how many of you know that uh, devotion, if you want to be, if you want to have daily devotions, uh, devoted comes before devotions. You, you got to be devoted to him first. If you're wondering like, man, why do I not spend time in the word? Why, what's going on? I would, I would encourage you like check your devotion before you check your devotions. That makes sense? Yeah, that's what they're like. Why do I not doing this? And you, don't look at that. Don't look at, am I tired? Don't look at, do I have too much going on? Don't look at, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't understand what it says. I don't even know where to start. Don't, don't, don't look there. Don't start there. Start over here with, wait, where's my devotion to Jesus? Am I, am I devoted to him? And we want to help you with your practice of daily devotion. So we encourage you to download a couple apps, Uversion and Bible Hub are great apps. I use them every single day. Out in the lobby, we, I think we have some journals left where we've got more on order. Man, you guys have taken those like crazy. In, that, in there is a Lord's Prayer guide, something I use every day if, if you don't, know how to how do I do this thing called devotions I've wondered that for years and this is a practice I use and it really helps me a lot so if it'll help you I encourage you to grab a hold of it but today um, in this series we started with this idea of be with Jesus that was week one be with Jesus then last week we talked about be like Jesus today I want to talk to you about behold Jesus beholding majesty and the glory of who our God is. So Luke chapter 5, I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation. And if you are new to the scriptures uh, and new to church, Luke was not one of the disciples. He just knew the disciples and he wrote down the most detailed account of Jesus' life. Uh, many scholars think that he got most of his information from Peter. And in this story, it, it talks about Peter. So some context around this um, they're, the disciples have not, the 12 have not yet been set apart by Jesus, but, but they've started to watch Jesus. They've started to uh, hear Jesus teaching. They, they believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So they're leaning into his teaching and following where he's at. And then we read this in chapter five, verse one. One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. Like what we're doing right now. Great crowd pressing in to hear from God. He noticed two empty boats, but the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. And so he stepped into one of the boats and Jesus asked Simon, that's, that's Peter, that was his other name, Simon Peter, its owner, to push out into the water. So he sat in the boat and he taught the crowds from there. And when he had finished, he said to Simon Peter, go out where it's deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. And Simon Peter said, Master, we, we were tart all last night. We, we didn't catch a thing, but, but, but if you say so, because he, he recognizes and believes Jesus to be the Messiah. He's like, and I, I know you're a great teacher, so that's what you're telling me to do. 
uh, we're going to do it. And this time, their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A, a shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. And soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. Any fishermen in the house that want that day? Come on, amen. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus, which is the natural response. He said, please leave me. I'm a sinful man. He was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with them. And his partners, James and John, they were amazed. And Jesus said, don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and they followed Jesus. Let's talk about behold Jesus. Father, uh, in the few minutes we have here, just speak through your scriptures to us right now. Help us to know what you're trying to say to us in Jesus' name. And everybody said, all right, you can be seated. Have you ever been awestruck by something? I mean, something that just took your breath away? To be awestruck, the definition of awestruck is this idea of being filled with wonder, um, of amazement. You're astonished, like you're, you're, it's jaw-dropping is what another definition says. It's, it's, uh, another one says that it's like you, you're at a loss for words where you're just like, wow, whoa. I think if anything we've ever been awestruck by, it's a day like today have we not been awestruck by moms? Come on, somebody. Are we not awestruck by moms? And what? Holy smokes. You are like, uh, you, you are like a Dr. Quinn medicine woman. That's who you are. You are you're unbelievable. You have this healing power about you that I don't even understand. We had some neighbor kids that were over at our house just yesterday, and one of them looked at me as little, and he goes, I a dummy ache. And I'm a dad. I went, okay. Sorry, buddy. He just looked at me like, really? And I was like, go see Miss Laura. <laughs> so he goes to Laura, and she's like, what's going on? I got a dummy ache. And she gives him this hug, and the power of the Holy Spirit goes through her body into his. Boom, he was healed. He was off playing five seconds later. I, moms, you're amazing. Like, um, I, I don't know what's going on with, with new, if you're a new mom, first-time mom, don't raise your hand. If you're a first-time mom, or I, I, let me help you here, because these first-time moms, it's, it's a rookie mistake, but you're buying these sanitizing machines. I don't, yeah, I, I know, you're, you're buying them, and you're like, well, I got, I got to have this. It says on the blog that I'm supposed to have this, and I saw on Facebook, if I don't buy it and pay $79.95, I'm a horrible parent. <laughs> you need to be introduced to the veteran mom move of the healing power of saliva. The binky falls on the ground. A veteran mom picks it up, holds onto it, wipes it off, pops it right back in that child's mouth. Good to go. That's a veteran. That's free. I just saved you $79.95 right there. Moms are amazing. And I mean, we're just, we are not just awestruck by, by moms. I mean, but uh, oh, uh, another thing about moms, the Holy Spirit talks to moms more than he talks to dads. And I don't know what this is. Any dads know this? Laura will say, she would say over the years, she'd go, the, God's telling me one of our kids is doing something. You need to go talk to him right now. God didn't tell me nothing. She's like, you go talk to him right now. Okay, yes, ma'am. And so I would go and I find this child and I'd go, what are you doing? I'm not doing nothing, dad. I'm not doing nothing. You're doing something because the Holy Spirit just woke your mama up and told you you were. I'm, uh, uh, and I would go, look, do us both a favor. Tell me what it is, because if you don't tell me, God's going to tell your mom, and then your mom's going to tell me, and I'm going to be right back in here. I'm going to have to bust your behind. <laughs> Every single time that they did not tell me, the Holy Spirit would tell Laura. She'd figure it out, and I'd say, I told you. They're like, you're right, Dad. Moms, you are amazing. And we are awestruck by what you're able to do. But we're, we're not just awestruck, though, by moms. We're awestruck by all kinds of things. So Laura and I were over in Arkansas, and we saw the, have you ever been through the Boston Mountains between Fayetteville and, and Fort Smith? Holy smokes. I mean, you get out there, and you walk around, and you see those rolling. It's, 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 there's no words. It's jaw-dropping. You, you, I don't know what to say. I don't know, I don't know what to do. And you, it's just incredible. I was out at Skytook Lake recently, and um, they are building these multi-million dollar mass mansions. Somebody has a castle they're building. Have you seen this? 
A castle. There aren't just castles in Muskogee. There are castles in Sky too. And when I saw this thing, I was like, holy smokes, is this like the Queen's vacation home? This is insane. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Or, and it could be a celebrity. It could be an athlete. It could be a, a musician. But we are so often awestruck by things in life. Have you ever been awestruck by something in life? But have you, have you ever, let me ask you another question. Have you, have you ever been awestruck by God? I mean, where, where, where you were overwhelmed by his presence. Like it, it, it might've been in, in a service, it might've been at home, it might've been in an event or something that happened, but you just, you, all of a sudden, God just showed up and there's no other explanation and you're like, ah, I have, I, and you're trying to convey, you ever tried, you ever been awestruck by the presence of God? God shows up in your life, you try to tell somebody about it and you don't have the words, do you? It's just falling flat of the moment that you had because you're awestruck. That's what happens when you're awestruck by the presence of God. And that's what's happening right here in this story. This is where we find Peter right after this crazy record catch. Look what it says in verse 9. He was what? Awestruck. He, he, his, his jaw was on the ground. He, he had no words. He was, he was overwhelmed by the whole event. He was astonished by what happened. Now think about this for a moment. Because Peter, he's looking at the fish. He's completely stunned by the catch. And this guy's an, a veteran fisherman. He's seen big catches before. And this time, though, he is overwhelmed, he is awestruck, he has no word. That is a serious catch in that moment. Have you ever had something like that happen to you? Have you ever had God show up in a moment like that for you? Laura and I just last year had this happen to us. We were looking for a, a new home because uh, if, you're, if you're new, you may not know this, but Laura's mom and, and Aunt Mary, they, they live with us and we were out of room. And I was like, well, this, is, this living arrangement isn't going to work. And, and uh, so we had to find a, a bigger home. And, and everywhere I looked, I, we had to have two master bedrooms downstairs for them. And then we needed to live like upstairs. And everywhere I looked, um, if I couldn't find anything. And then when I did, it was, I mean, you know, way out of my price range. Like, not, like we ain't going to be living there. And I remember just kind of going, okay, well, we'll just kind of settle here for a little bit. And we'll just see what God does. And we just began to pray. And I, I'll never forget, last year, right around this time, we were out walking. Laura and I were walking through the neighborhood, and we come around the corner, and we were talking about how much we loved our neighborhood. Because we've lived there almost 20 years, and we feel like it's our mission field. We, 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 we love our neighbors, and we love ministering to our neighbors and helping our, our neighbors. And, and I was like, man, I love this neighborhood. Plus, we have trees. You know what I mean? Like full trees. I don't have time to go move somewhere and wait for a tree to grow. I mean, come on, I ain't got that kind of time on this guy's ticker. I need a fully mature tree now. So we walk and come around the corner and there's this green belt on the backside of the neighborhood. And we've walked this hundreds of times and we were talking about, this is what we love. I mean, this green, we always thought, man, wouldn't it be great to live on this green belt right here? We just always talk about that and be so great. And we have a couple homes that we really liked. And we were walking by one of the houses and Laura said, look at those planters. Those are amazing. And I was like, they are. Now, this house was not for sale. There's no for sale sign on any of the, any of the houses on the entire green belt. And I looked at the house and I said, yeah, but I said, look at that driveway. That driveway's flat because we needed a flat driveway. And I said, and it's big, like we could have four cars, cars pulling in and out of the garage, cars parked, nobody's moving cars, parents of teenagers, can I get an amen? Come on, somebody. Yeah, that's the parents of teenagers, like, I got, I'm feeling you. Well, I live with teenagers. that's what I, I live with, right there, that's what I, I call them. You need to put your phone away now. Um, anyway, I digress. So, it has the flat driveway, I look at it, I'm like, wait a second, that's a big house, and, and, and right there in the middle of the street, I zillowed it. I said, oh my gosh, it's got two master bedrooms downstairs. This, is, this would be a dream house. This would be perfect. Oh my gosh, we could stay in the neighborhood. And uh, Man, if this house ever comes up for sale, we're buying it. We're buying it. So we walk back to the house, and I'm, I'm going in. Laura's going to do another lap around the neighborhood. And I looked at her, and I said, I, I dare you to go ring their doorbell. <laughs> She's like, you know I will. <laughs> and she did. 
She went over, she rang their doorbell, and she said, um, hey, so this is kind of weird, but we're your neighbors and looking for a big house, blah, 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 blah. And if you're ever, if you ever think about selling this house, and the guy's like, well, how do you, wait, what are you talking about? What, I mean, not, you know, if you ever do, we would be interested. And he goes, how do you know that we're selling the house? Well, I don't. He goes, he goes we're putting the house on the market in two weeks. Within 48 hours, we had seen the house, we had put an a, a offer in on the house, and we would bought the house, and we live in that house right now, and it has become a, an amazing testament to what God does. And, and I, every time I pull up, it's been a year now, every time I pull up, I'm honestly awestruck. I'm like, God, you, I, and I just have no words for what God has done. But here's the thing, it's easy to miss God in moments like that. It's easy to give credit where credit isn't due. You, you get that promotion. You get accepted at that school. You make that team. You, 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 uh, you, you get that financial windfall. You get that unexpected gift out of nowhere, and you're like, wow, this is incredible. Who would have thought about this? This is amazing. You know, and then you, next thing you know, you say, well, you know, I've been working hard. Been working hard, been putting in the time, been grinding. I mean, we did the work, and, and next thing you know, you've missed God in that moment. And here's Peter. Peter could have done the same thing. Could have just high-fived his buddies, said, man, this is amazing. Woo! Can you believe this? But he doesn't. He, the scripture tells us that he turned, turned back towards Jesus. I'd like for you to write this down. Whatever I behold will have a hold on me. Whatever I behold will have a hold on me. What has a hold on you right now? Is it, is, it, is it this thing over here? Or do you keep turning back and beholding Jesus? This idea of to behold is like uh, awestruck on steroids. Okay, that's what behold means. It's this, it's this idea to, to behold is to, is, it holds your attention. Like you, you can't look a, away. You, you look intensely at it. It's, it's not this quick glance. That's what behold is. It's like sunrises and sunsets in Oklahoma. I love them. Anybody else love sunrises and sunsets? It's my favorite thing about living in Oklahoma. I love to watch them. But here's the thing about a sunrise or a sunset. If you look away, you might miss it. If you're driving, you ever dr been driving and you see a sunrise or sunset and you, you can't really appreciate it, can you? Because you can't look intensely at it. You, you gotta, you've got to stop and you've got to behold that, that sunrise or that sunset that's happening in front of you and What's interesting about a sunrise or sunset is I think the wonder and the awe of a sunrise and sunset is found in what it touches. It's, it's the clouds, right? It's, it's the way the sky lights up. It's, it's the horizon that you're just mesmerized by because with the, with the sun, you can't look directly into the sun. And I think this is the wonder and awe of God. It's all around you. It's everywhere. It is touching things all around you. Do you see it? Do you see the wonder and awe of God? Don't miss the moment to behold him. Come on, turn to somebody and tell them, don't miss your moment. Come on, turn to somebody. Don't, don't miss your moment. Don't miss your moment to behold him. But the true glory and majesty and splendor and awe of, of God is too much to behold. You can't look upon him. He's too amazing. He's too glorious. And this is what Peter's experiencing. It's real interesting in this story is he's experiencing the wonder and the awe of the catch. This is insane. This is amazing. And he turns back and he sees what Jesus has touched. And he sees the splendor of it, but he turns back to the one who made it possible. But what's interesting, when he turns back, he can't look at Jesus. Look what it says in verse 8. When Peter realized what had happened, say it with me, he fell to his knees before Jesus. He face plants. 
He can't even look. He can't even raise his head. And he says, oh, Lord, please, please, you got you, you, you to you leave me. I'm, I am a, I'm a sinful man. And now what's happening in this moment is Peter suddenly recognizing that he has some kind of horrific sin in his life. I, I, I don't think so. He wasn't perfect. He knew that. But I think what was happening in, in this moment is he recognized who Jesus was and, and who he wasn't. That's what happens when you're in the presence of God, doesn't it? Suddenly you recognize who he is and who I'm not. I, I recognize how weak I am, how frail I am, but I also recognize how strong he is. I'm like, man, I don't know how, I have no power, I have no ability, and then I look to him and I'm like, holy smokes, you have all power, you have all authority. That's what happens when you're in his presence. Like when I, when I look at myself, I see that I'm, I'm broken. I got problems. You got time? I got problems. I'll tell you some of my problems. I got problems. We all got problems. Come on, turn to somebody and tell them, you got problems, I got problems. You got problems, I got problems. We all got problems. And when I, when I look upon myself, what I see is I see my brokenness, I see my fallenness, but when I look at Jesus, what I see is the, the healer. I see the redeemer. I see the resurrected one who can heal my soul. When, when I... When I look at my own life, I see my deficiencies, but when I'm in the presence of God Almighty, I see that he is all sufficient. He can meet every need. He can change any situation at any moment. This is who our God is. I like the writer of Hebrews. Uh, whew, I'm out of breath, I'm out of breath. <laughs> Hebrews 7, 26. It says this, he being Jesus has, has been set apart from sinners and he's been given what? Say it with me, the highest place of honor. He alone has the highest place of honor in heaven. This is Jesus. This is the one we worship. This is the, the one who... Him alone who is worthy of our praise. He is higher and greater than anything we could ever have or ever experience on this earth. Do you know him? Have you experienced him? Have you, have you beheld him? Because whatever you behold is going to have a hold on you. It's what I love about um, Sunday. It's what I love about when we come together and we, we gather like this is because in this experience here that we're having, this worship service that we're having, we can experience the presence of God. Have you ever been in a, in a service where all of a sudden you, you just sense the presence of God? You had that trouble, you had that problem, you had that struggle, you had that thing, or you didn't have nothing going on and all of a sudden... The presence of God floods over you. God speaks to you and suddenly you recognize you're in the presence of God and you're like, oh man, this is amazing. I, can, we, can we encapsulate this? Can we do something? Can we, can we bottle this? this? This is incredible what's happening here. This is what I love about us gathering on Sunday. And, and by the way, that's what's happening here in this story before the catch. So before the catch, they're having church. Okay, Jesus is gathering with people. They're in the very presence of God. And the scripture actually says they, they were pressing in. So my question to you today is, are you pressing in? Are you pressing into Jesus? Because when you press into Jesus, you never miss a moment to behold him. And I would tell you that if you're like, man, I've never... I, Oh, you're getting all hyped up today, preacher. You're spitting and you're sweating and you're, I, I just think he's going to swear any minute. I don't know what's happening. This guy's crazy. This guy's crazy. Why did I come today? It's because I beheld him before. I've been in his presence. But, 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 it, but if, you've, if, you've, if you've never been in his presence, you don't know how to behold him. And I would tell you this, if you want to behold him, if you want to experience his presence, it only happens when you press in. If you don't press in 
and you check out, you're not going to experience his presence. I'm going to turn to somebody and encourage them right now. Tell them, press in, press in. You got to press in. So they have this church service. Verse 4 says, when he had finished speaking, so this is after the service, this is after everybody has, has gone home and then they're, they're making mom all the wonderful food and taking care of mom today, taking her out to eat and caring for her, making sure she has all of her needs met. Guys, that's what we're doing today, right? That's what we're doing, right, man? That's a, mm -hmm, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. All the ladies said amen. amen. Wow, there's like three of you ladies. You don't want that? Come on. <laughs> all right, anyway, okay, that's fine. But when he had finished speaking and everybody goes home, he said this to Simon Peter, say it with me, now go out where it's deeper. Now go out where it's deeper, and he says, and let down your nets to catch some fish. What I believe is that God wants to take you deeper and take you beyond the Sunday morning experience. As great as this is, as amazing as what is happening right now, I mean, we, but we say this all the time here is we are not just a Sunday church. We are the what? Everyday church. He's not just a Sunday God. He's an everyday God. He's not here waiting on you to come back. It's not like you're going to get up and leave and he's going, hey, get the lights on your way out. Have a great week. I'll see you next week. You coming? I'll see you in three weeks. Okay, come on. Whenever, whenever you can get, I'll be here. I'll be here waiting on you. No, no. He's not just a Sunday God. He is an everyday God. So what, what, is it, what does it mean to go deeper with Jesus? I think one of the ways that we go deeper is through the core practice of daily devotions. It's not the only way, but I do think it is a way. And it's if daily devotions. I want you to rethink what daily devotions is because I think what daily devotions is, it's, it's about pushing off from the shoreline and going out where it's quiet, away from the chaos, away from the noise, away from the busyness. If you've ever been on a boat, you know what I'm talking about. You get out away from the shoreline and everything starts calm and there's no waves and it's peaceful and I believe it's out there is where God can talk to you. I think daily devotions are kind of like, uh, think of it like this way. I think the chaos and the, the noise of this world is a lot like the, the kiddie pool at the public pool. You know what I'm talking about? Like, there's, you go to the kiddie pool at the public pool, there's nothing but what? Noise, confusion, kids running, kids screaming. They ain't got it. They're tearing their swimsuit off, running naked through there. Moms are chasing them. There's pee pee in the pool. There's nuts, water screaming, cry. Everything's chaos. You, you know, one thing you never see at the kiddie pool? A mom putting on Hawaiian Tropic reading a book. <laughs> you never see that at the kiddie pool. You know, what, you know what I like when you go to the public pool? Adult swim. Wow, that was apparent right there. That's a... Uh, because what? Kids got to get out of the water. Get, get, get. Just get. You know, and you're just like, the water's calm. Just swimming. Shh. It's always that one idiot dad that wants to dive off the diving board. Uh-uh. It's my time. You ever swim by your kids? <laughs> Mock them? Uh -huh. Can't get in the water. No, no. Shh. My time. My time. I, I think that, that, that life is like, like the kiddie pool. It's, it's chaos. It's, 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 there's noise. There's, it's busy. It's stress. There's worry. There's anxiety. There's notifications. There's email. There's text. And people pressing on you. And, and I, I, I want to submit to you that I think daily devotions is an opportunity to have an adult swim. Can I get an amen? amen. It's an opportunity to push back the noise, push back the chaos, set the phone aside for a few minutes and sit, just sit with God in his presence for a few minutes and breathe. I think that's what God wants to do. Don't miss the moment. Come on, turn it and get somebody again. Tell them, don't miss the moment. Don't miss the moment. Look what it says in verse six. At this time, so, and, and this time, their, their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. So what are your, what are your nets full of? 
Are they full of worry, stress, anxiety, crazy schedule, kids going everywhere, I'm going everywhere, got to get this done, got done, this thing, that thing, this person's pressing on me, got that appointment, got to go over here, make this happen, got this, got that. Is, is that, is that what your nets are full of? I, if, that is, if that's you, I just want to encourage you, let down your nets. Let down your nets because Jesus wants to fill them full of his presence, overflowing with his grace, overflowing with his kindness and his compassion and his love and his peace. He wants to, to fill your nets. Verse 11 says this, as soon as they landed, as soon as they landed, they what? Say with me, they left everything and followed Jesus. So, so they, they looked at their nets and the catch, and, and it was impressive. But then they looked at Jesus, and they were awestruck. When, when you look at your life, I bet you have some pretty impressive things. But you also have some things that are demanding of you, some things that are asking things of you, some places you gotta go and things you gotta do. And what I'm wondering is, are you more awestruck by that than you are beholding the very one who wants to help you, redeem you, and set you free? What are you awestruck by? Jesus, Peter's looking and he sees this. I would be mesmerized by that catch. I, that's all I'd be looking at and thinking about, but not, not Peter. He's, he turns and, and, and his attention is held by Jesus. So what's holding your attention? What has you? What's gripped you? Because whatever you behold, is going to have a hold on you. But can I tell you that's good news? Because if you're holding on to Jesus, that's the best news of all. But if you're holding on to something over here, it's going to have a hold on you. That's why your heart feels the way it does. That's why your mind is all jacked up. That, that, that's why your spirit is not at rest because, because you're beholding this and you're holding on to it and it's got a grip on you and you need to put that down and come over here and just behold Jesus. That's good news because when you behold him, not only do you have a hold on him, but he has a hold on 